What is making your brain literally shrink? Literally atrophying the tissue within your brain. Sure, aging has this effect, but we're gonna talk about specific things that can shrink your brain in a shorter amount of time, even when you're younger. And it sounds absolutely crazy to think, but it happens to our muscle, it happens to other tissue in our body, why wouldn't it happen to our brain? So let's talk about how to preserve the brain. Down below, I put a link for seed, which is what is called a daily symbiotic. Now what's interesting in the world of B vitamins, some B vitamins are formed via what is called biosynthesis from our gut microbiome, our distal microbiome. So that means part of our gut can actually form B vitamins. So when we're talking about the importance of B vitamins, having a good microbiome is very important as well. So that link down below gets you 30% off of the Seed Symbiotic, which is a combination of prebiotics and probiotics in a single capsule. Very unique technology. You've probably heard me talk about them on this channel before, but now the discount is 30%, whereas before it was 20, so pretty awesome. So it's really cool. They've got a lot of technology behind the multi-stage delivery of their probiotic and prebiotic and how it fertilizes that probiotic. So really interesting, plus they fund a lot of awesome research on the microbiome. So that link is down below. I don't typically recommend a probiotic unless you're someone that's really trying to make a change. That being said, the only probiotic I typically do recommend is going to be seed. So that link is down below. The first thing that can atrophy your brain is not exercising. And I'll cut right to the chase here and I'll explain with each and every category I talk about things that you can do. I'm not just going to give you the data. Let's actually talk about what you can do. So there was a study that was published in the Neurobiology of Aging Journal that discovered that when subjects were doing low intensity or just low amounts of exercise, their levels of brain atrophy were relatively high. Their gray matter was shrinking, their white matter density was less. But then when they looked at subjects that exercised with a little bit more intensity, they ended up having a good preservation of their brain mass. Now the study looked at gray matter, looked at white matter, and it looked at what are called regional volumes. So that looks at specific regions of the brain and where the atrophy is occurring or not occurring the most. What they did find is that the higher the intensity exercise, so people that were doing like high intensity bouts of exercise, they had more preservation in the frontal region of the brain. So the prefrontal cortex, that frontal lobe. This is interesting because this is what's associated with some executive function, that logical thought. So it's kind of funny because we say, oh, meatheads, they're just like, stupid, they just have muscle. Well, it turns out the meatheads might actually literally be meatheads and have more actual brain mass as they get older. So what do I suggest you do in this case? Especially if you're getting older, you wanna get the most bang for the buck. And it looks like intensity matters with the brain. Low intensity matters for blood flow, and that's tremendous for flushing out metabolites, for keeping everything moving. But as far as stimulating the actual brain, we want higher intensity. So three times per week, try to do high intensity interval training, where you're doing one minute or maybe 30 seconds of really hard work, followed by however long it takes you to recover, followed by 30 seconds to one minute of hard work, followed by however long it takes you to recover. And doing this three times per week for about 20 minutes is really all it would take to preserve the brain. Plus, you're gonna get a nice muscular effect as well. Another tip is to maybe do some fasted training every now and then, simply because you might have an increase in lactate to the brain. And lactate, based upon other studies, seems to be very powerful when it comes down to cognitive performance. So again, this is something that is still needs to be flushed out with the research, but very interesting. The next one is in a similar category, but that's not stimulating your brain. What's wild is we used to just think that around age 60, 65, people's cognitive decline just started to decrease. And then we started realizing, wait a minute, that's when people are retiring. People retire and they stop using their brains as much, and then all of a sudden they start getting cognitive decline. The American Journal of Geriatric Psychiatry published a paper looking at seven different randomized controlled trials. And they demonstrated with these papers, by looking at all this data, that when people utilized their brain and had cognitive stimulus, they ended up having a longitudinal relationship with cognitive performance. So not just for cognitive decline, but people that actually tried using their brain in critical thinking, crosswords, things like that, that improved their cognitive performance. The reason is, is that stimulating your brain, just like exercise, acts as a trigger. It acts as a trigger for something called BDNF. Now BDNF grows new neurons. It can improve synaptic density. Okay, so you also have what is called synaptogenesis, where you're forming 
new relationships, new synapses between neurons, meaning cells, neurons that couldn't communicate well before are communicating very well now. And this is so key because as we get older, you start losing that and you don't realize it. And it can happen fast if you're under a lot of stress and things like that. So what do I suggest you do here? Well, doing things like crossword puzzles in the morning, doing things like Sudoku, doing these little quizzes and things like that as cheesy and as old man and old person as they sound, they're tremendous for keeping your brain alive. You also need to do things like critical thinking. You see, when you're younger, you have to critically think. You're trying to get ahead in life. You're trying to solve problems. And being able to take time out to critically think, work on a project. If you're retired, find a side hustle. If you're not mentally stimulated, find something where you have a drive and an impetus to push it harder. Okay, because that eustress is actually good for the brain as well. Distress is not, but eustress, being stressed about doing something and working towards something, encourages the brain to grow. The next thing is on the other side of the coin, and that is stress in general. We need to avoid that stress in general, but I'm gonna give you practical things that you can do rooted in research to modulate stress. Now with this, we look at a study published in the journal Neurology, took a look at 2,000 participants, okay, and they gave them a battery of different cognitive tests, and they also gave them an MRI so they could look at their brain. With this, they found a very strong association with morning cortisol levels and lower gray matter volume. So the higher the cortisol, the lower the gray matter volume. And then they found that the higher the cortisol, the more microstructural damage there would be, specifically in what's called the corpus callosum. So very, very important for regions of the brain to communicate with one another. So stress can essentially accelerate the shrinkage of your brain. How do you combat that? Well, I have a few things. Okay, for one, things like sauna. Sauna is relaxing. It's good for the brain. It increases what's called glymphatic drainage. Okay, the glymphatic system washes your brain. Cerebral spinal fluid goes through your brain, and a lot of times you need this intracranial pressure that can be generated from high heat. So it can flush metabolites out, and it actually helps you feel better, helps you feel more relaxed. So that's a very important piece. Red light or just light exposure in general. Andrew Huberman talks about this all the time, right? Going out in the morning and exposing yourself to that low light. That has a huge impact on our mood. Okay, also of course meditation, things like that. Breath work, okay, simply stopping and doing box breathing just to control your stress. When you stop thinking of it as a stress control tactic and more of a, hey, I'm trying to improve my brain tactic, it makes it a little easier, at least if you're wired like I am. The next one sounds cheesy, but it's not fasting, okay? Not taking a break from food is terrible for your brain. And I recommend people do at least 12 hour fasts. Try at least eating in 12 hour blocks every day. 12 hour fast, 12 hour eating block. That's all I'm asking you to do. But if you look at some data, rodent model data, but still very interesting, a study that was published in PLOS1, took a look at mice and it had them alternate day fast or do a higher fat non-fasting diet for 11 months. They found that the fasting group had an increase in dendritic proteins. Okay, so that means there was more dendritic density. Now dendrites are what receive a signal within the brain. So if we have more protein, then these dendrites are stronger and they're able to receive a signal better. Okay, there was also lower oxidative stress in the fasting group. So less oxidative stress, more dendritic proteins, the brain is purely running at a higher level at that rate. Now the proposed mechanisms here, even though it's rodent model stuff, what they're suggesting is maybe it has to do with increases in human growth hormone. Not because it's growing the brain, but human growth hormone will encourage the body to utilize fats a little bit more and spare protein. So we're not breaking down proteins within the brain. And we're not breaking down as much protein in the body either, in the muscles, which is just kind of a nice casualty of that. What I would recommend you do, 12 hour fasts every day. Don't think of it as a fast, think of it as life. And if you want to accelerate a little bit more than two days per week, do maybe an 18 hour fast. Doesn't have to be anything crazy. You're just skipping breakfast or maybe you're doing it the opposite and skipping dinner. I don't want to go down a rabbit hole of how to fast specifically in this video because I have dozens if not hundreds of them on this channel as is, but taking a break from food is good for the brain and that's plain and simple. Next one is limiting the alcohol. Now, are you ready for some scary stuff? Okay, I've got two studies here. One that takes a look at alcoholics and one that takes a look at people that just drink, not alcoholics. The first one was published in Neurology, Neurosurgery, and Psychiatry. So this study showed that the more alcohol consumption, the lower the gray matter volume and the lower the white matter density. It doesn't get much more cut and dry than that. The longer that they've been exposed to alcohol, the worse these situations were. But then we look at a paper published in BMJ 
that was more so geared towards non-alcoholics, just people that were light drinkers, moderate drinkers, or heavy drinkers. And the study was big. It took a look at 1,432 people, okay, so it was big, and they found that there was prefrontal overall shrinkage, atrophy, with more alcohol consumption particularly in the heavy drinker group. So people that would maybe drink three to four times per week with decent amounts would have significant prefrontal cortex shrinkage. That overall frontal lobe was less. So that can happen quick too, because this data looks at things over the long haul and over the short term. So I hate to say it, but the quickest way to improve your overall brain size and make sure you don't atrophy is probably to just quit drinking. But if you must drink, try to maybe drink one night per week and not binge all the way. It's that heavy, heavy drinking that is really causing the problem. Moderate consumption, maybe not quite so bad, but even the data there shows that like none versus moderate consumption or none versus light is still a significant difference in terms of how it impacts the brain and the body. This next one is one of the most important ones and there's a very practical thing with it, okay? And that is not combining omega-3s with B vitamins. B vitamins are exceptionally important for the brain, particularly B6, B9. Okay, B12 is good too, but B9, folate, and B6, very important for inflammation, for neurotransmitter function, for a number of things. There was a study that took a look at using B vitamins to sort of fight off mild cognitive impairment. Basically, it found that B vitamins don't even work as an intervention unless omega-3 levels are high enough. They think that it has to do with what is called the hypophosphorylation of tau proteins. Tau proteins are associated with basically accumulating and triggering neurodegenerative conditions, Alzheimer's, other things. Big problem, right? So it looks like when B vitamins or omega-3s aren't sort of in synergy, we end up with this hyperphosphorylation, like too much of it, and we have too much of these tau proteins and ultimately leading to neurodegenerative issues. Now vitamin B6 modulates inflammation and modulates kind of the homocysteine levels within the brain, which is very, very important overall. But if the omega-3s aren't there to reduce the inflammation and allow for more membrane fluidity within the brain, then none of this can work together. So we're finding that, yeah, B vitamins are good for the brain, but only if omega-3s are present. Now, omega-3s can work independent of B vitamins, but B vitamins are so critical, it's like they need to go hand in hand. So what do I suggest with this? I would say one to three grams of good quality fish oil, calamarine oil, krill oil, cod liver oil, one to three grams per day. I'm less concerned about like what kind, EPA, DHA in this case. DHA is generally better for the brain, but there's all this controversy over which one's better. Just get it in, it's better than none. Okay, and then take a B complex and maybe an additional B6. The thing with these kind of B vitamins is they flush out of the system fast, so you probably do wanna make sure you're taking those daily. The very last thing that I wanna to touch on is just reducing the sugar intake. Sugar will affect your brain. Okay, and the oxidative stress in the brain is definitely a real thing. Not to mention, if you become more insulin resistant, you have less ability to recycle or turn over dopamine, which makes you feel like garbage and feel depressed. You have less dopamine, less motivated, and therefore you're less motivated to do the things that we talked about to make the proper changes in your life. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel, and I'll see you tomorrow.